Okay, I think we are ready to get started with the last talk in the session. We have co-presenters today. Um, our first, and I guess the main speaker today, is uh, Hannah Kuzner, uh, one of my former students, so I'm very excited to see her. Uh, Hannah is a recent graduate of Franklin Pierce University with a bachelor's degree in environmental science. She is now finishing her master's degree in conservation biology at Antioch New University, New England. She joined this long-term study of deer browse in regional forests in 2021. And she's been working with uh, Peter Palmiato of Antioch. He received his doctorate of forestry in ecosystem ecology from Yale University School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Peter is chair of the Environmental Studies Department at Antioch University. He's also director of the Monadnock Ecological Research and Education Project and director of Antioch University Forests and co-director of the Antioch Spatial Analysis Lab. I have no idea how he has time to be here, but he is. <laughs> All right, um, so they will be talking about to fence or not to fence controlling deer browse in regional forests. Um, hi, my name's Hannah. Um, today I'm talking about whether uh, to fence or not to fence when you're trying to control deer browse in your forest. Um, today I'll be outlining um, kind of why deer are an issue in New England, um, and then the long-term study I was a part of, um, how we set it up, the study site we're at, the question we're trying to answer, and then my uh, research method methods and results. So uh, white-tailed deer populations have grown significantly in the um, new uh, northeastern area. Their populations are around all through North America, and they're a very port, um, important undulate to the ecosystem. Um, and as humans change the landscape within, uh, within urban developments, um, they are creating great habitat for the deer. They create edges of the forest, whether it's um, in cities or agricultural purposes, and these edges allow deer to have shelter and uh, food resources. Um, uh, in areas like Keene, where it's a urban area that's kind of next to a well-grown um, forest, um, this is a perfect area for deer populations to grow. Um, and we do have large numbers, but because it is an urban um, area, hunting isn't allowed. So there are limited uh, management strategies to help um, kind of keep the deer out of a forest if you want it for uh, profitable uses or agriculture. Um, White-tailed deer are a keystone herbivore um, and that tends to put stress on their ecosystems due to their large numbers and population and the overbrowsing of their woody regeneration. Um, they usually prefer hardwood species like oak and maple, as well as conifers like white pine. And a single deer can consume around seven to eight pounds of vegetation a day. Um, they can affect the community by reducing resources for other species, as well as alter the forest directly. Um, they remove seedlings, which jeopardizes the future of the few, uh, forest and uh, the regeneration and their preference for certain species like, um, like oak or maple uh, allows these browse tolerant species like American beech to kind of overtake the forest and really thrive. So um, my study was in the Maynard Forest in Gilson, New Hampshire, which is owned and managed by the Monadnock Conservancy since 2004. Um, the forest is around 91 acres and it's located right on the edge of Keene. Um, it's dominated by hemlock and beech, as well as some oak, pine, maple, and birch species. And the forest is used for many re reasons for management, as well as recreational and educational uses. Um, so in 2010, uh, the first initial timber harvest in the Maynard Forest happened. And throughout the year until about 2012, the Monadnock Conservancy kind of saw an, um, a regeneration problem where trees weren't really growing back and they were trying to have the area for profitable uses. So if you're trying to grow trees and they aren't growing, there's an issue. Um, so in about 2012, once they recognized the problem, 
um, they started to get funding to help look at different uh, treatments for American beach specifically. And this included getting a fence to help exclude deer. Um, this photo was taken. Um, it was after the initial timber harvest, but before the first. And you can see that there's kind of no regeneration within this big gap. Um, it's a lot of brown and not a lot of green. So then in, uh, then in 2014, this long-term study was initially started um, by the Monadnock Conservancy in collaboration with Antioch University. And it was first sampled by a graduate student, uh, Marilee Frable. And then in 2014, I mean, 2015, 2018, and then again in 2021, it was resampled uh, by other graduate students. So the studies that they were a part of were looking at um, what the effect of fencing has on regeneration as well as what the effect um, on regeneration is when American beach is specifically mechanically or chemically controlled. And then with my 2021 data, I specifically kind of looked at the effect deer browsing um, and the pressure it has affects a regenerating forest in the long term. So um, in 2010, with the initial harvest, um, 13 patches were randomly selected and cut. They were around uh, one and a half acres each, and six plots were set aside for the American Beach um, and Deer Browse study. Three out of the six were fenced to help exclude the deer from the area, and those are the ones with the yellow circles around them. And these fenced in areas created an environment that could show what the forest would look like if no deer affected the area. Um, the other three were left unfenced to naturally allow the forest to grow and show any potential impact deer do have. Um, each of the six plots were then split into two. Um, one area was the cut patch or a gap and the other was under the understory. So within both areas, there were three separate strips um, of treated area, which were as well randomly selected. Um, one strip was the control where the area was allowed to grow naturally. Uh, the other was treated with foliar herbicide, specifically on American beach. And the third treatment was mechanically cutting American beach. And this helped promote growth of other profitable species. Um, in each strip, I mean, yeah, in each strip, a transect line was um, set out and it had 10 sampling quads within it where I recorded my data. So within each of these sampling quadrants, I counted the seedlings and saplings by species. I then measured their height and, and put them into nine different height classes from less than 0.5 meters to above seven meters. And then I observed the browse impact, which ranged from no browse on a um, individual to severe browsing, which is over 50% of the individual browsed. So my, my results today are going to show the comparison of the deer browse trend between the three years of um, sampling. Uh, then I'm going to specifically look at my 2021 20 browse level on the regeneration and the height distribution between the fenced and unfenced areas, then the species composition of each area and what species were found above the browse line, and then the density of the forest. So my graph here shows um, the browsing over a seven year period, comparing three of the sampling years. Um, when I was analyzing my data, I moved them in yeah, I moved them into two groups, um, unbrowsed and browsed, which was regeneration light to severely browsed. Um, the 2014 sample was what we assumed to be the baseline of the study. And it sh showed approximately 40% of, uh, of the unfenced area was browsed and of the fenced area was browsed as well. 
Um, after a full year of fencing, the browse then dropped to 8%. And then in 2021, the browsing was down to 2% in the fenced area. Um, these two photos show the difference between two sampling years in 2014 with the baseline data in an unfenced plot. You can see there's a lot of gaps, not a lot of growth here and there. Um, and then in 2021, an unfenced plot that I looked at which showed a lot more growth, a lot more um, green. So now I'm going to talk specifically about my observations within the gapped areas um, in both the fenced and unfenced plots. And this graph shows that there is significantly higher browse in the unfenced area, which continues the trend that fencing is excluding the deer and continuing and continuing the browse impacts in the unfenced area, although at a lower level than the initial results in 2014. Um, next, this graph looks at the density of the fenced and unfenced plots per acre. Um, in the fence, you can see there's about uh, a little over 13,000 individual saplings per one acre which compared to the unfence is a lot because it's 5, 000, uh, a little more than 5,000 um, individuals per acre. Um, this shows that there is a lot of browse pressure that is reducing the amount of regeneration in the unfenced plots. Um, this photo shows the comparison between what our, my fence plots looked like in 2021 which was kind of dense and full of um, saplings and seedlings compared to my unfence where you still had kind of the forest edge and it was um, a lot more open. So this uh, table shows the total count of each species in the fenced and unfenced plots. And it shows that there is a more diverse species composition in the fenced. Um, plot with only striped maple not being um, observed. And then in the unfenced species composition um, is kind of less diverse, only having about American beech and then maple with high levels, but it also didn't have any quaking aspen or yellow birch observed. Um, so this graph shows the percent of each species in the fenced and unfenced plot. Uh, red maple was more dominant in the fenced area by, and it made up 38% of the fenced forest. Um, their high numbers could be contributed to a really um, good seedling year. And then in American beech was the more prominent species in the unfenced area and it made up 41% um, of that forest. Um, next, I looked at the height growth, and this shows that the majority of both um, the fenced and unfenced regeneration was under 0.5, the 0.5 meter height class. Um, and only in the fenced area was regen regeneration really able to grow into these upper height classes. So the um, nine high classes were then split into two groups, um, either above or below the average browse line. A deer browse line is around um, 1.8 meters to 2.7 meters. So I um, organized high classes one through three as below the browse line, and then high classes four through nine above it. Um, and it shows that around a quarter of the regeneration um, in the fence treatments were growing above the browse line. Um, this chart shows that more species were able to grow um, above the browse line, uh, specific, specifically black birch, which made up about 52% of the species in the fenced area. Um, and there was not as many species able to grow in the unfenced with 76% of it being dominated by American beech. So um, my conclusion that I came to was I was able, um, that deer are removing early successional species 
and disturbing the natural growth processes of the forest, um, especially with high numbers. And I believe if you want a functioning forest, um, managing for browsers like deer is very important and fencing is an effective uh, treatment to plan if you can't do other ways. Um, I would like to have a special thanks to the Naranoff Conservancy and um, NRCS for funding. Um, and then very special thanks to Peter for helping me um, with it as well. Question, questions for Anna and Peter. Um, in addition to deer, did, was there any evidence of moose browsing? Uh, I wasn't able to see any moose browsing specifically. Um, I, I couldn't really find a lot of other animals, tracks in the fence, obviously. Um, but one thing I did find were bears all around there. There was one instant, there were a baby bear on the other side of the fence. So I was kind of in there waiting, but <laughs> waiting for either to see the mom or for it to go away. But uh, I wasn't really seeing other bigger um, browsers. Uh, so your conclusion was that it's best to that fence to clear out. Have you taken like time and consideration, the cost, labor into effect? Yes, um, fencing is a very um, costly thing to do. That's why personally, I think fencing could be something if um, Mananoff Conservancy was trying to have a profitable forest for timber harvest. So if it's kind of like an agricultural use or for a profitable use, it could be a good um, investment because um, further along, you will, you won't have that much damage. But I mean, for um, basic homeowners, it might not be a good cost. Yeah. You know? Do you have numbers on what the deer population is in the area? Just kind of wondering, you know, how much deer population and pressure is here versus I know it's different throughout the state in different areas. Yes, um, I did not see any of those um, population numbers, but um, it was mostly through the Nana Conservancy saying they, they noticed the population. Um, and I was kind of on the late end of the study. So if anything, um, mine was focusing more on how, if we just eliminated the deer, what would that do? The, uh, the uh, estimated numbers is like 15, Deer per square mile in that in the Keene area and uh -huh. could be potentially uh, larger because of the no hunting in Keene. Um, but yeah, it's the roughly 15 per square mile from previous samples we took in that area. Which clearly is significant, large enough to have an impact on the forest. How did the fencing affect, or did you have any way of telling how it affected the movement of like bobcats and any other wildlife that was out there? Um, I don't think that was something we yeah, we, 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 um, we had camera traps out there in 2018 to see what other wildlife, we didn't pick up any moose. Um, and um, no bear or no bobcat on the, on the cameras. But their the fencing is um, in these around these patches that were two to three acres in size, but included the understory. Um, so wildlife would be able to walk around that. And un unfortunately, over time, it's the investment in fencing is significant because you have to maintain them. And as Anna knows, you know, when she went out with Rick Brackett from the Conservancy early in the season, we were out there setting up transects that trees come down on the fence setting and they have to be repaired. And so part of the visible browse that occurs inside the fencing could be have occurred when the fencing was down for short periods of time. So it's not totally unbroused. So we do see, did see some evidence and certainly. 
um, small mammals are in able to move in and around the fencing. Any, any thoughts on having tried doing comparison with singular two protection for any other you know, tree species? Um, you know what I mean? The, the protective tubes that are tall enough, I think they're four or five feet tall, that <clears throat> will protect that tree for that until it's above browse height, as opposed to the expense of a fence. Not in this study. Not in this study, no. I think it would be a good. It, it would probably be a good comparison. Yeah. Yeah, it's a time matter of resources. And if you're you're managing and trying to uh, regenerate acres and acres of forest or patches, it's just not viable to do that. In one of your earlier slides, it showed like it looked like um, the fenced and unfenced were kind of almost even mm -hmm. for a few years. And then it then there was a drastic difference. And I was trying to, I, I didn't quite follow along. So I was kind of wondering, it's like, was it before fencing or was it like, how was the browsing happening once it was fenced? Um, so I guess it's not even, but it's pretty, you know. The, yeah, the 2014, if I can jump in there, is um, the initial sample. And so the fencing wasn't up, but um, late in the summer. And most of the browse is occurring in the spring. So that's why the 2015 sample is the actual treatment of the fencing. Okay, it wasn't cool. Yeah, and so the, as Hannah said, our baseline was about 40% um, of the vegetation was getting browsed and then after one year it dropped to eight percent you know and, and critically if we look at this data in particular we see the, you know, the the browsing percent is dropping in part because a lot of the vegetation is growing above the browse line and it's getting more dense and deer getting getting um opportunities to browse elsewhere. Again, we think about landscapes and nearby this forest, big clear cuts and other cuts were happening. So deer were likely being diverted um, to where browse is more, more plentiful in those areas. Hannah, in your opinion, given what you found out, do you think it could be feasible to fence in areas until a certain degree or above the browse line? Definitely. Um, when I was observing, at least with the ones in the higher high classes above the browse line, there were none that um, none really had the browse impact on them compared to the ones that were below. They were the ones really getting browse. So definitely if it's like a cost thing, but I think having a fence or having that management until they do grow above browse is also helpful. All right, no other questions. Thank you very much for coming.